We've been monitoring juvenile salmon out of Salmon Coast Field Station for sea lice since 2001. Um, so last year was our 15th year of monitoring. At first there were very high lice levels, which is what kind of prompted a lot of the controversy early on about the expansion of salmon farms in the Broughton. But more recently, you know, from about 2005, there have been very low lice levels on juvenile salmon and farm salmon. And that's been good news for wild salmon. Um, and we started to think that maybe sea lice weren't such a huge problem in the Broughton and, and on the coast. But last year in 2015, we saw very high numbers of sea lice at the same levels sort of that we saw in 2005 when we were having outbreaks. And so this recent paper that we had come out was trying to figure out why sea lice started to come back and be a problem again. The paper was looking at the high sea louse numbers that we observed on wild juvenile pink and chum salmon last spring in 2015. In the monitoring that we did last year we saw about 70 percent of the juvenile salmon that we sampled being infected with at least one sea louse. We predict that up to sort of 39 percent of salmon that would have come back may have died due to sea lice. Which is which is quite a bit when with all the other stuff they have to deal with. The things that seem to best explain these high counts we were observing were really warm water, so advanced or, or sped up development of sea lice. We know that, that warmer conditions mean sea lice grow faster, they reproduce faster, and they, so the farms as a result kind of spew out more sea louse larvae. Because the winter temperatures in 2015 were almost a degree warmer than over the past 10 years. And so that gave sea lice again, it accelerated their development, and so populations could grow a lot more quickly and it was a lot harder to get things under control than, than people were expecting. Sea lice can disperse in the water column from salmon farms and reach up to you know, 30 kilometers before attaching to another host. Um, and so any farm that's within that radius can catch lice sort of from another farm. And so if farms don't coordinate their treatments, what can happen is that lice from one farm can spread to another farm and infect salmon that maybe were just treated. And so rather than treating and having the problem go away for you know, a number of months, that farm can immediately be re reinfected by its neighbor because the neighbor wasn't treated. The main thing that, that fish farms do in British Columbia to deal with the, the louse problem is to use an in-feed chemical. The, the industry name is Slice. And they put this in the feed and they feed it to the fish and then the fish basically exude this chemical and it it kills off the lice. So the louse numbers go down on the farmed fish. And as a result, the, the lice don't pump out juvenile lice to infest wild salmon. So the chemical they use is a crustacean neurotoxin. So like any parasiticide, lice can evolve resistance to these chemicals. If resistance to slice develops, there's the potential that we wouldn't be able to control them well. And we'd lose our, the one tool that's in the pocket right now to deal with these outbreaks. So I think the outbreak that we saw last year really emphasized that the sea louse problem hasn't gone away. Um, they, it still has the potential to get away on us, especially if winter temperatures continue to be warm with climate change, or sea lice develop resistance, or if farms don't coordinate, um, then sea lice can still get out of control and impact wild salmon. 